All right, you're live on yeah. News Now. Excellent. I love News Now. So, how are things going? I know you had lunch with the governor just now, Arizona governor. Yeah, we had we had lunch with the governor and Angelos. Um, if you could turn your monitor down, that would help so I don't get the uh, feedback. But we uh, went inside, broke bread with the governor, talked politics. You know, he's been a little late to the party on the Trump uh, bandwagon, but he's on now and he's supporting him. And he will tonight in the roll call uh, read Arizona's 58 delegates for Donald Trump. Now, there could be some stragglers still in the group in Arizona because, you know, there's been a little bit of dissension. Uh, some people, certainly Cruz supporters, who are not on board the Trump train. And in fact, one of those lost their credentials. We, we brought you that story yesterday. Lori Hack got her credential pulled by the uh, party chairman of Arizona. And so she's now sitting in the overflow from the Texas delegation up in the nosebleed. So it, there's, it's been interesting. Well, John, for viewers who are tuning into News Now who missed your story yesterday, can you elaborate on that and her credential being pulled? Yeah, they, uh, the delegates met yesterday morning, and Robert Graham, the state party chairman for Arizona, you know, they want unity on that floor. They don't want to have a bunch of divisions showing up on national television. And this goes for every delegation uh, across that convention. So some of the party chairmen said, you know, if you're not going to vote, the way you are supposed to vote. In other words, Arizona voted for Donald Trump, so the delegates should reflect that in their vote on the floor tonight. And if you're not gonna vote for Trump, you can't sit with the delegation. And so they pulled Lori Hack's credential yesterday, and so she's now sitting as a spectator. How do you think the uh, convention went overall yesterday? I mean, a lot of the talk on Twitter is about Melania Trump's speech, and it's kind of taken right. away from the message that you know everyone else up there brought. You know, um, I have to be honest with you, Sami. A lot of these speeches I don't see because we are covering the delegation and we're talking to people and interviewing people, so we miss a lot of the coverage that somebody at home might see. What I could catch of it, it looked like a typical convention to me. Not a lot different than conventions I've covered in the past. And I was telling you yesterday, this is my ninth convention, and they all start to kind of blend together. It's, it's pretty typical. Even though Trump said this would be a different kind of convention, you still look at the grid on who's speaking and politicians are more than 50% of, of the speakers. So even though he wanted a real star-studded affair and turn it into entertainment, it's still, after all, is a political convention. There's really no easy way to get around that. So I, I think they did fine. Um, I've read things on Politico that this whole thing was a train wreck, nine, night one for Trump. I don't really see that, honestly. It felt like a normal opening night of a convention. Maybe a little more um, ominous in that, you know, they were talking about keep America safe again. And so there was a lot of discussion about immigration and crime that comes from that, uh, illegal immigration. And there was discussion about the U.S. military. We got a lot of that, that the world's not a safe place. So it was a little downbeat in that respect. But Melania Trump, I don't know what to say about that. I, I, can't, I can't know whether they lifted that from Michelle Obama's uh, speech before or took parts of it, or whether these are just themes that spouses would almost universally say about their husband. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Right, right. I know you mentioned some of the overall themes, keeping America safe again. We heard from parents who lost their children um, because of illegal immigrants, for example. We heard from Brandon Mendoza's mom. Did you cross paths with her at all yesterday? Right. Yeah, we talked to her yesterday right after she gave the speech. Uh, we ran that at 9 o'clock. And she talked about how Trump re personally reached out to her. He wanted her to be part of the convention. In fact, she told me, um, just to back up so people know who we're talking about, Brandon Mendoza was a Mesa police officer killed by a wrong way drunk driver in 2014, who also happened to be an illegal immigrant. So the point she made was, my son would still be alive if there was a border policy that was effective that kept people who shouldn't be here out. This guy had warrants out of Colorado. He'd been in the criminal justice system in Colorado. Even though there were threats of deportation, he was never deported. So he ends up killing her son in a wrong way drunk driving crash. This is a, a Mesa police officer that connected so well with that community and was a shining light of what police officers should be and should aspire to be. 
And so the community and Arizona lost a great young man when he was killed. And she said, you know, why are we doing this? We've got people here who should not be here, but besides that, they're here and they're committing crimes. And they're robbing our own communities of good, honest people whose lives are cut short. And she just finds it incredibly offensive, and obviously she's devastated. And Trump reached out to her and said, I want you to tell your story at the convention. And she said yes. And in fact, she told me that Trump, you know, she was only going to be here for the first day of the convention. And that Trump personally said, I want you to be here all four days. I want you to be part of this. So he's, he's reaching out in very personal ways to some of these people. Right, I know another person who lost their uh, son as a result of an illegal immigrant was Jamil Shaw Sr. He mentioned how right. Trump right, reached out to him. Were you able to speak with him at all, or did you catch his speech? No, I did not speak with him. But you know what, when we're on this subject, I think, I think it's, it's noteworthy. Here we are in Little Italy in Cleveland. And John, John Netzel on the camera, we'll just pan around. This is Jude LaCava and um, Rick D'Amico's old neighborhood. So when we talk about assimilation and we talk about people and, and, and immigrant communities, this is a classic example in America. This happens to be in Cleveland, uh, probably 20 miles from the convention hall. And this is where folks immigrated to and there are Italian flags hanging proudly in this neighborhood. But what you come away with when you talk to folks here is, yes, they're proud of their heritage, they're proud of their roots, but they are Americans first. And that is something you really feel in these neighborhoods. And this is the thing we're grappling with right now, um, with immigration, not only when we talk about immigrants from Muslim countries, predominantly Muslim countries, um, you, you get into this discussion about assimilation. People want to come here, they want to live here in America and, and have all the benefits of that. But do they also want to be Americans, which is the, the one thing that kind of binds us all together, is that you can come from wherever ever you come from, and it's a melting pot, and it's a great part of what makes this country so amazing. But at the same time, if you have people on different pages completely, that creates issues. And, um, and it's just, it's, it wasn't lost on me when we came here today. Right, that's so interesting that you brought that up, John Hook. Um, actually, uh, about five years ago or so, I asked my dad, I was like, well, do I identify with being Indian or Pakistani? Because he was raised in India and lived in Pakistan for like college. And I didn't even ask him about America. And his response was, I'm American. I've lived here for 40 years. I'm none of them. Yeah. And it was, it was so shocking. It was so interesting for me to hear from my dad. I have a similar story um, my, on my dad's side. Uh, my dad's mother's side, Swanson, Swedish. And he was telling me a story just the other night. He's 92 years old. He said, you know, I remember growing up, my mother would come unglued if they would, if Cece, my great, great grandfather, would start talking Swedish. She would go crazy. She said, not in this house. We're going to speak English. <laughs> Hardcore about this stuff. It's just really interesting how you hear these stories. We're all from somewhere. Right. Uh, Barack Obama is absolutely right about that. We're all from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The question is, do we still have this binding agent, which is being an American? Right. And you're proud of your heritage, you're proud of your ancestry, but the glue that binds us seems to be a little bit frayed right now. Right. Right. I, I mean, I haven't even been in an elementary school. I'm assuming kids are still saying the Pledge of Allegiance on a daily basis, right? <laughs> they are at my kid's school. Yeah, they are. See, those are the things so, that I feel like bind us at an early age. I agree. I agree. The national anthem, all of that. Um, it doesn't mean you. It doesn't mean you turn your back on who you are. But are you also part of this? And that's that's a, that's a debate we're having. You can feel it in this country right now. People, uh, people talk about this a lot. We were talking about it with the governor today. I mean, he's, uh, he's half Italian, Governor Ducey. Mm -hmm. So that's why we decided to break bread here at Angelo's. We thought it'd be a good spot to just kind of chill out, have some Italian food. And it's, it's home for him. He grew up in Toledo, not, not that far from here. Um, he, he Actually, I was surprised. He said he'd never been to Cleveland before, the governor. It's amazing for an Ohio guy. And remember, you know, there's so many issues right now. His father was a, a beat cop in Toledo. 
So we talked a little bit about that as well, about, about how his father uh, would feel about everything that's going on right now um, concerning cops and, and what's happening out on the street. And a gentleman here eating lunch from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution who we were talking to. You got a second? I, you got your palm here going. One short break all day, and now you're going to put us on the air. And I know that feeling. What we're doing. Yeah. Give me your name, first of all, so people know your bio. I'm Kevin Riley, the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, oh, and this is Thank Greg you. Bluestein, one of our political That's reporters. Great. I, I, pardon me that I didn't know that. Yeah. But, you know, we know your byline, but and we know who you guys are, but we don't see your faces sometimes. Yeah, we're not as famous as you television <laughs> folks, but we like to think we work hard. Now, you and I were talking earlier. Your, your father was also a beat cop. Right, right. You know, Cleveland's my hometown. That's part of why I came here from Atlanta. And uh, my father was a police officer here for about 30 years. So uh, it's uh, great to be back home, see a lot of friends and family. And uh, in light of all the things that have been happening in our country lately, it's just very, I'm very mindful and attentive to the issues that are being discussed at the convention and in our country at large. We were talking about some of these beat cops that they go through a whole career and never draw their weapon. Right. I just think that, uh, you know, again, reflecting on my dad, you know, who's, who's dead now, uh, the cops of that era were, were just a different breed. You know, it was a lot more about their sense of community service, their sense of duty. And I don't think they, uh, they were exposed to as much pressures as cops are exposed to now. And I think they enjoyed maybe more respect sometimes than police officers do now. But uh, he and I had a lot of debates over the years about the role of police and, and what they would do. But the thing I'm always reminded of is, you know, cops don't like bad cops either. You know, most cops work really hard, do a really great job, and they just, uh, they're just as troubled by cops who get out of line as they are by the lack of respect for the work they do. What would your dad think about what's happening now, this tension between the minority community and cops? I think he'd be very concerned in the way that uh, all good cops are now, too, because they, are, they, they spend their careers protecting and helping people, and they would be very concerned that uh, there maybe some among their ranks aren't, aren't honoring that tradition the way they should be, and that that's resulted in some disrespect. Can I, before we let you go, I got to let you get back to your chicken parm, but can you give me a sense of your feeling? You probably covered a lot of these conventions, as, as have I. This is my ninth, and you probably cover more of them. How do you think it's going so far? What, what, do you detect a really different tone? To me, they kind of all blend together. You know, I just think that uh, a lot of the people here feel like the country is at a real inflection point. And uh, we'll, it remains to be seen how this election will come out, but people have strong feelings. I think we all have to hope that uh, it, it results in a better understanding and conversation for our, company, so, our, for our country so that when uh, we get done with the election in November, we can all move on to what everyone feels like a, will be a better, better and better place. Thank you. And for now, the better place is that chicken parm. Did you get a shot of that? That was amazing. We got to get the, uh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, we're in Little Italy, as you know, uh, Samia. So we're, we're taking in the sights and sounds, and it's all good. It looks good. I'm kind of envious you. of your meal that you just had. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you? Angelo. <laughs> Angelo is the fine owner of this place. No, you don't want to be on TV. What do you got? Oh, you want me to give this to Jude? Jude LaCava? <laughs> oh, there we go. This is the blending that we talked about. It's an Italian-American flag. There you go, Samia. Wow. Getting back to our original point. You're an alternate delegate from New York. We're going to... Hey, we, we, you got time, right, Samia? Time is not an issue on News Now. Is that right? We can keep going. Okay. Here we go. Okay. And your name is? Joe Emanuel. Joe, are you on the Trump train? Yes, I am on the Trump train. Delegate from New York. Alternate delegate from New York, uh, upstate New York, Montgomery County, actually. I live in Amsterdam, New York, and uh, uh, we're here to rally uh, behind our candidate for the, to be the next mayor uh, of America. Or, excuse me, not mayor. I, I'm thinking mayor, uh, next president of the right. United States. I yes. was thinking maybe you're I, throwing something mayor. in there. I'm a, a former, former mayor, mayor uh, of the of, uh, city of Amsterdam. Which, can you tell me how the cohesion is right now in the, in the, in the hall? Because, I, I mean, I, there's some deep fractions going on and, and uh, fractures going on. John McCain from our state, Arizona, is not here. Our other senator, Jeff Flake, is not here. The governor of Ohio is not here. No former presidents are here. I mean, it's really kind of odd in terms of political conventions in that regard. You know, it is uh, a concern, uh, but, but I think we have to look beyond that. Uh, we, we, we can't 
allow Hillary Clinton to just walk into the White House again like she did four years ago um, with Barack Obama. So the, the, the idea is, is to have our delegation, and yes, there's going to be uh, disagreement. That's part of the political process. That's why America is so great, because of a democracy. But yes, and this is the place to do it. We have 50 states here um, that are here all supporting or trying to become a solidified group of... Is that possible? It, it, but it, it's going to become an issue whether uh, you want Donald Trump or you want Hillary Clinton. And these people who have sort of the non-Trump people, then who are they going to vote for? They're actually letting Hillary Clinton come in and, 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 and appoint the next Supreme Court justice. And that's a huge, huge mistake if she's allowed to do that. So when this uh, row happened on the floor yesterday, where the rules were getting a little dicey and the, and the anti-Trump people were actually close to kind of getting this to where you might have some type of uh, further vote on, on your nominee. Right. Were you troubled by that or were you just saying, okay, this is democracy and it's messy? Well, I was troubled, uh, of course, but it is democracy and it is part of the process. And, and, and I think it's a good thing. It's a, it, the process is the greatest process in the world. And uh, things like that do happen sometimes. They happen in local governments. They happen in, in, at, at the county levels. And they also happen state. And now you're seeing it nationally. And you but think at the end of the day, everybody will come I together. think at the end of the day, we're all going to rally behind Donald Trump because we have no other choice. I am a huge Trump supporter. There you uh, go. Uh, I, I was a part of a delegation of county chairs. I, I served as the Montgomery County Chair in New York State. And uh, we, uh, a few of us uh, uh, upstate uh, county chairs gathered. We got an appointment to meet with Donald Trump at the Trump Towers in New York City. We tried to get him to run for governor against Andrew Cuomo. He had bigger sights. And he must have. We, we didn't think that at the time, but you know, not that Rob Astorino, who did run for New York State governor against Andrew Cuomo, excellent candidate, and we rallied behind him. But that's the point. We wanted Trump upstate New York. We, we're, we're lacking jobs in the economy in the upstate. Downstate has a whole different agenda. So, you know, that's the part of the process, and that was at the state level. So I, I think uh, when, when it comes down to the bottom line is that we're, we, we Republicans and Democrats and Independents uh, Party, uh, conservatives, we're all going to rally behind a winner, a leader, Donald Trump. Listen, thank you, and I'll see you on the floor tonight. Thank you. It'll be, it'll be a fun night. I really appreciate your time. Yep. All right, so we got a flag for Jude. <laughs> we got fed, and uh, we're in Little Italy. What, what could be better? You guys are enjoying that trip, that's for sure. And things are going to get busy tonight as well. <laughs> when do um, yeah? When did the festivities kick off tonight? Uh, I think tonight. I think they really it gets going in earnest really around eight o'clock Eastern, five o'clock our time. Maybe a little earlier, maybe seven. I'm not sure when the gavel goes down. Do you know when the gavel goes down tonight? Is it seven or eight? Seven. Yeah. Oh, really? The session starts at 5.30, but the, the big primetime stuff doesn't obviously happen until 7 or 8 o'clock. So the featured speakers generally happen later, and they were a little messy on that last night. Um, Melania Trump came on, and then there were some fine speakers afterwards that the country, for the most part, didn't get to see, General Flynn being one of them. Yeah. So, um, you know, it... it yeah, there is stagecraft in this, no way around it. Right, I noticed that. Yesterday we were carrying the whole thing live, and we did continue to carry it after Melania Trump spoke, but we also had a wide shot of the entire convention floor, and I would say there were only about 25% of the people left in the audience. Yeah, right, right. I mean, after the big speakers disappear, sometimes the delegates disappear. They've been there all afternoon. A lot of them have been there much of the day because they had that floor battle over whether to get back into this business of do we allow the anti-Trump people to have their say and maybe wrest this nomination away from Donald Trump. Believe it or not, they got a little closer than people might think. Um, that got a little dicey yesterday. And obviously for the party, the party now, it's in, in this weird position, some of the party insiders now are trying to rally the troops behind Donald Trump because they don't want a fractured party going into November. So some of the very people who were skeptical of Donald Trump early on in this process, they find themselves now in the position of trying to save him yesterday, and they did.
Well, it'll be interesting to see how things play out today, John. I'm sure we'll check in with you again later this afternoon, early evening. Thank you so much for chatting with us all morning. You got it, Sami. That's right. It's morning there. We're in the <laughs> middle of afternoon here, so. That's right. You just had lunch. <laughs> I'll see you tonight. All right. Thanks. Tell Jude we got his flag for him. I'll let Jude know. Thanks. <laughs> All right, guys. We're going to take okay. you back to the GOP.